mother fucking bond. You know, the channel might be called Pretentious Writer because I want to talk about filmmakers that I look up to and hidden gems that people don't talk about and indie movies, uh, I mean, you know the drill. But I'm gonna let you on a little secret of mine. I kinda really love James Bond. This franchise has a special place in my heart, you know. My dad has always been a fan and I still remember the first time he played Goldeneye for little me and I had a blast. These movies are fun, escapist blockbusters filled with these unique quirks, you know? And I love them all. I love M, I love Q, I love the crazy gadgets and stupid feelings this franchise gives me. And I might do a video talking about the franchise as a whole, maybe in the future, but right now, I wanted to focus on the present. To be more specific, on Daniel Craig's legacy. After all, his last movie, No Time To Die, is about to come out, and besides, that's what the title of the video is about, right? And his era is an interesting one. At least for most people, his work on the role has been nothing but great. Yet his movies have, I don't know, kind of flip-flop on quality? So I wanted to revisit them. And uh, let's see if this still holds true, shall we? I think before talking about the movies themselves, I need to address the casting because nowadays everybody seems to agree that Craig has done a great job in the role, but back then this was far, far and away from the reception he got when he was first announced. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but the internet and the press grilled his ass for months and months during the production of his first film, running headlines like Bland, James Bland saying he had pale, flattened face and large fleshy ears, my god, what the heck. Some even complained about the fact that he was blonde. Oh yeah, did I mention that some fans created a website called DanielCraigIsNotBond.com and ran a campaign for Eon to recast the role? So yeah, as you can see, he got a lot of flack for the casting. But nevertheless, they pressed onwards. The producers were saying that they wanted to revamp the franchise bring it into the modern times, as they say. For that, they brought in Paul Haggis, writer-director of Crash, to work on the script with Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. Remember these two guys, they worked on the scripts of all of Craig's films. And for the director, they hired Martin Campbell, who directed GoldenEye, also the first film of Pierce Brosnan as Bond, and also made to change the tone of the franchise back then. And all of this culminated with... Now we get into the meat of it, because man oh man is this movie the absolute shit. I think what I fucking love about Casino Royale was how it was such a shock to the system. They really followed with their promise to modernize Bond and made such a gritty, hardcore film. It was basically new ground for the franchise and they killed it. The stunt work is phenomenal, I mean who doesn't remember that insane chase at Mad Madagascar, 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 shit. Right in the opening of the movie, by the way. But not only that, the action set pieces in general are very creative. There's this really crazy pursuit at the airport, there's a final shootout at Venice, even the quieter scenes like the poker match are incredibly tense at times. And Daniel Craig gives his all to each one of them and makes Bond this brutish, cold-hearted bastard that is nonetheless compelling to watch. Which, talking about him, it must have felt really good back then to prove the haters wrong. He did such a great and unique job with the role and all the critics recognized that. So much that he was being considered for awards, something that absolutely no other Bond ever did. He wasn't nominated for an Oscar, but he did end up nominated for the BAFTA, which is basically the British Oscars and a huge part of award season. But it would be unfair of me if I didn't show some love for the other actors because my god, Evergreen is an amazing Bond girl and honestly, maybe the best? Her Vesper has such a sharp tongue, she plays off Bond incredibly well, but there's also this vulnerable side that she slowly reviews throughout the history. Also, Mads Mikkelsen, who makes for a menacing villain, even when the entire plot is about him getting in hot water with powerful people and having to scramble to get his money back. It's kind of a loser when you stop to think about it, but he's framed in such a way that you never look through this angle and Mikkelsen does his best to push this forward. 
This also connects to another thing that's just so great about this movie for me, and that's how unpredictable it feels. For example, the way the plot progresses. The poker match, that was sold as the big conflict on the trailers, doesn't play out until like half of the movie, and it only does because of all these subplots that happened beforehand. Also, the fact that Bond doesn't kill the villain, and the guy dies at the end of the second act by the hands of another villain, and there is a whole third act that uncovers more shit and gives the movie a tragic ending. Not only this structure is very unlike other Bond films, it's also different from the usual blockbuster as well. In any way, all these elements culminate in such an amazing action movie. And with Casino Royale, the franchise was off to a good start. Everyone was hype, waiting to see what a sequel would bring to the table. But... Yeah, about that... I want to tell you guys something. I don't like to bash other filmmakers. Because as a filmmaker myself, I know how tough it is. And I know that even when your film is complete dog shit, the trouble and hard work that you and your cast crew had to go through to get it done, it exists and it's the same as every other movie out there, be it good or bad. Having said that, I feel like I can talk about Quantum of Solace and all its problems, especially because the issues here were kinda detached from the talent of everyone involved. They've openly talked about them during the following years, so there's that. And because this movie has one, and only one problem. Script. There's some spotty editing here and there, but nothing groundbreaking. The script, however, it all began around 2006, when Neil Purvis and Robert Wade began to work on it. Finishing their draft on April 2007, Paul Haggis, once again, was brought in to revise and deliver a second draft. Progress was slow, but they still had time. The movie was scheduled to open in November 2008. And then... The Writer's Guide of America strike happened. The thing is, back in 2007, they were negotiating a new contract with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Just think of them as the alliance between all small and big studios in the industry. The two sides reached an impasse, and the Writers Guild, seeing no other alternative, voted for a strike. That meant that all working screenwriters in Hollywood would stop doing their jobs. TV shows, movies, you name it. Anything that was in pre-production, that a writer was working on at the moment, suddenly grinded to a halt. The strike lasted 100 days and cost approximately $500 million to the industry. And that's just the industry. But why am I telling you all this? Well, guess which movie was a casualty of said strike? Yep, Quantum of Solace. Just so you have an idea, Hackes delivered his draft two hours before the strike officially began. It started on November 2007. Quantum was scheduled to premiere exactly a year from then. That meant that the producers were stuck with a script that was far and away from finished, and they didn't know how long they would be without a writer to polish it. The situation was so bad that Craig himself and the director, Mark Foster, were forced to jump into the script and fix it, even though, as Craig himself admitted, a writer he was not. I mean, for Christ's sake, after the strike ended and they were in the middle of production already shooting it, they brought in another writer to fix the third act. So, as you can see, the situation was really ugly. And the reason why I'm talking about all this is because, unfortunately, the result of all this shit show kinda shows on screen. It's not even that the story is messy, it's just that it barely has a plot. It also doesn't feel like Bond at times. I know for the themes it has, the movie needed a more serious plot, but the dourness kinda brings it all down. It lacks some of the levity and sharpness of other Bond films. It's also the shortest one, clocking in at 1 hour and 30 minutes. And at times, it definitely feels like it's just jumping from one action scene to the next. Barely any time given to breathe or settle in the emotions. I mean. There are some exceptions, of course, like the scene where Bond and Camille hang in a cave. But there are very few in between. And talking about the actors, acting all around is okay, but it isn't remarkable like last time. 
Olga Kurilenko tries her best, on paper her character does have an interesting backstory, but it's never expanded so it feels like another victim of the quick runtime and the messy script. Same thing with Mathieu Amauric, he's a big name in France but his villain is so uninteresting and, I don't know, boring. I think if there's something redeemable about this film, it's Bond's arc. The way he processes Vesper's death is him basically scorching the fuck out of the earth wherever he passes. And his conversations with M are probably the best part of it. Sadly, there aren't many and they're too quick. So I could waste time also mentioning the plot holes and whatnot, but again, I don't want to beat down this movie too much, it isn't exactly horrible, but man is it also not good. The movie was a box office success however, but everyone on the production knew they could do better. And it was with this feeling that we move on to... So, remember when I said that Casino Royale was a shock to the system? Well, unfortunately there's no better term to describe the situation here, because this movie is... It feels like they wanted to course correct, and for this production they went hardcore with the big names. John Logan, Oscar nominated writer of movies like Gladiator, The Aviator and Hugo, penned the script. On the director's seat, Sam Mendes, Oscar winner for American Beauty. Not to mention director of great films like Road to Perdition and 1917. And finally, for DP, they brought Roger Deakins. Uh, I mean, do I need to introduce him? The man is a fucking pope of cinematography, his work is freaking legendary. So as you can see, there was a lot of prestige behind the camera. And the crazy thing is, the gamble kinda paid off. Given the other blockbuster franchise this Oscar treatment, and the end result could be a boring film that loses its essence. But for James Bond, it just fit. Skyfall brings back this classy vibe, the fun banter, and it still manages to be way darker than many of his predecessors, Casino Royale included. The script is probably the sharpest that the Bond franchise has ever been. I mean, just listen to some of these lines. The whole office goes off in smoke and that bloody thing survives. Your interior decorating tips have always been appreciated, 007. My complexion is hardly relevant. Well, your competence is. Age is no guarantee of efficiency. And youth is no guarantee of innovation. But now they don't eat coconut anymore. Now they only eat rat. Also, the directing, the cinematography, some shots in this movie are godlike. And gone are the choppy action scenes. The action here is cut in a way that's frenetic but well paced, you know? And they're not afraid to hold on to a shot if it's doing a good job. I mean, look at this. Come on, man. And you know what? To this day, Skyfall is not only the most immaculate looking Bond film, but one of the best looking action films, period. Now, going back to the plot, one other thing I really enjoyed is how the stakes are way more personal this time. So it was no crazy megalomaniac wanting to rule the world or play God, even though he can and the movie actually shows you that. He just wants revenge. The themes of old versus new are peppered throughout the story, be it with Bond who's old and wary versus Silva with his new tech mumbo jumbo, the conversation between Bond and Q, the whole subplot of people wanting M's head because of her failures and how she's old news, not to mention how much this story reflects on the past and legacy of both M and Bond, this movie and this script is way deeper than people give credit for. Also, since I'm talking about the characters, I gotta say, this might have the finest acting of the franchise as well. I know the script helps, but everyone on screen seems to be, I don't know, having fun here. All actors are delivering, not one person seems to be phoning in. Rob Fiennes makes for a great foil turn ally to Bond and M. Ben Whishaw embodied this new version of Q just perfectly and Naomi Harris... She's money penny, seriously, she's the money penny for me now. And my god, I'm still bitter that Judy Dench was snubbed for an Oscar nomination. She's given such good material this time, and both her and Javier Bardem hit a lot of precurs precursors during award season, but Alice not managed to get that nod. A real shame, but at least I'm happy that her last outing as M wasn't such a great movie as this one. And I'll be honest, I think this is my favorite film of the franchise. I keep flip-flopping between this, Casino Royale, Goldeneye and Goldfinger, 
But Skyfall has all these elements that brought together just makes for a perfect, classy, sexy blockbuster that actually has a lot to say. At the end of the day, Skyfall was not only the highest grossing film of the franchise, hitting over $1 billion, it was also the first Oscar winning film, with Adele's theme song deservedly winning Best Original Song, and the movie also nabbing Best Sound Mixing, in what was an actually bizarre tie, but it happened. And with all that said, how the heck do you follow up to this? Well... Spectre is a weird beast. Young Productions saw the success they had with Skyfall, and it's as they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, am I right? So they brought back everyone, John Logan is hired once again to pen the script, and Mendes is back in the directing chair. Everything pointed to this movie being another success, but as you all remember, it was not. Spectre did well in the box office, but it got tepid reviews, with many calling it a disappointment. So what happened? You see, I was also not a fan of this movie, but revisiting it with the knowledge that I have now, I must say it was a lot better than I expected. The acting is still good for mostly everyone. The film has a slower pace than your average Bond, but it has a mood. It keeps building up and I was surprised by how involved I was. Was I ready to change my mind on this film? But then the third act happens. Which leads me to speculate exactly why you came. It was all me, James. It's always been me, the author of all your pain. My little brother. And you see, this time, I could identify clearly the three big problems with this movie. One, the aforementioned third act. Two, the subplot between M and C has a nice commentary on war, on terror and surveillance, but it's so undercooked that it feels like filler compared to Bond's plotline. And three, the retcon about Blofeld being responsible for all of Bond's misery, how all of the villains slink back to him, yada yada, it all just sucks. Number three has some foreshadowing throughout the story, but the revelation is entirely present on the third act. And number two feels filler especially because of how it concludes in such an unremarkable way. And that also is a problem of the third act. So as you can see, number one is kind of the cause of all these movies problems. And I kept asking myself if they run into trouble with it during production. Oh. Oh. Oh, look at this. Exactly what I thought about the actual movie. So as you can see, they ran into all kinds of trouble trying to fix the third act. Sam Mendes even confessed on Tim Deakin's podcast that the script was still unfinished by the time they were shooting it. Just like one other movie, huh? Well, the results speak for themselves. Just like with Quantum, I don't exactly blame any of the creatives involved in this. It's clear that they tried to do their best. I just wish they hadn't shot themselves in the foot with having to rush and meet the release date though. In any case, it seems like they have learned their lesson since there's gonna be a pff, six year gap between Spectre and No Time to Die, which I want to believe was to make sure this movie was gonna succeed. We'll see. At the end of the day, I wish I had something deep or meaningful to close this video, but I don't know, I just can't find it. What I can do is speak from the heart that no matter how good or bad things have gone during his era, I will always continue to enjoy a 007 joint, and most importantly, no matter how this last film is gonna turn out, I'm really a fan of what Daniel Craig did with the character. If you ask me, he deserves a spot among the best Bonds ever, and I hope people look at his legacy the same way. This is The Pretentious Writer, thank you for your attention, have a good day. Bond, I need you back. I never left.